I'm delighted and very honoured to have been asked to, to take part in this evening's uh, events by chairing the questions and answers session. And I'm delighted that Field Day are doing this, having this annual Seamus Dean lecture. Uh, Seamus happily still being with us as well. Uh, and I think it's, it's very good because it, it marks the work that Field Day did in the past uh, at actually a much more difficult time in Irish society when they tried to have some sort of discussion and conversation about where this country was going and how to pull it together uh, when it was, as I say, much more difficult to do. And I think that the whole idea of having discussions and conversations about where we are going uh, is very, very valuable. Um, and having intellectual discussions about it, so long as they're not too intellectual and too erudite. Um, and it's not dissimilar to something that President Higgins has been trying to do too in a, what he called his ethical initiative. He's just published a book of his speeches, uh, which I think are very well worth reading because uh, it's a critical voice about much wider issues of society and international issues as well. Well, having said all that, and, and I suppose one should also remember uh, at this stage the members of, of former members of, of Field Day who aren't with us any longer, Brian Friel, Seamus Heaney, who's centre has just been opened in Bly and where I'm hoping to go tomorrow, and uh, David Hammond, a lovely man of music and culture. Um, anyway, I'm particularly pleased to be here for another reason. Next Wednesday marks the 48th, 48th anniversary of the October the 5th March in Derry, which really started the civil rights movement, a very important event. And Bernadette was on that march, and that, I think, was what catapulted her into politics. And I'm glad to see and to hear that she has not lost the passion and the courage and the radicalism and the sense of stinging humor that she had even in those early days. And remember, that's 48 years ago. Now, that may be a sensitive thing to say uh, in, in this situation, but I, I would say that Bernadette was obviously only a slip of a girl at that time. <laughs> Uh, you know, barely out of primary school, I'd imagine. Anyway, um, discussion and criticism. We've had uh, a very powerful address from Bernadette and a very powerful criticism of the system of government here at the moment and some of the people who are in it. And I think it's important to say that you know, whether you, dis whether you agree or disagree with the Good Friday Agreement, and I happen to agree with the Good Friday Agreement, and I think that it was a valuable thing, and I think that the, the ending of the armed conflict was very, very important in order to allow politic political discussion, real political discussion, to begin. But whether you agree or disagree, it's important to be able to talk about this and to be, be able to be critical. And criticism is a vital aspect of democracy, it's a vital aspect of forming policies. And criticism may be stinging at times, uh, but there has to be A, room for criticism, B, room for humor. And uh, I suppose it's, it's my Catholic upbringing that we were also told when we were young that criticism was good for the soul. So I think the people who may smart under the criticism should just think about that. It's good for the soul. Maybe they'll be rewarded in heaven for it or something. I don't know. Anyway, having said all that, um, we have time for some questions and answers. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who will want to uh, ask Bernadette various things about her long career in politics and about the present situation. And just because I know myself from being a lecturer, it takes you a while to, to collect your thoughts and think what is it that you actually want and be able to, to formulate that properly. So I thought maybe I would just start off and get the ball rolling, and to ask her to, to move in a slightly different direction, because I know that, you know, very dear to your heart, and the, the work you've been putting your heart into for the last 10 or more years is of step, so it's your own empowering people. And I know that that is both working with local communities in the area, and also working, uh, as you mentioned, working with immigrants uh, and migrant workers and so on, and I think 
you know, it would be very interesting to hear from you a little bit about the type of work that you do and the effect that it has on the people you work for. Mm. So, over to you. Right. Uh, can you hear me or do I need to use this? Yeah, can you hear me up there, yeah? Yes. Oh, that's great. Right, what do I do? What do I do in STEP? The well, STEP came together in, in about 1996. Uh, and when I said earlier there about being, I suppose, paralyzed by anger and, and frustration and pain and a lot of other things, uh, that's certainly where I was, I'd say, without any hesitation that in my long political and, and personal existence, which will very shortly, sometime next year, span 70 years. The period of the late 80s, you know, that kind of 87 to, to 96, that 10 years was probably the, the most difficult and, uh, and challenging and painful period of my whole life. And there was a point then uh, when I decided, you know, I, I, can't, I can't let this happen. Uh, not least I can't let it happen to me. I cannot, I, I can't do this. I can't just do nothing but be angry. Uh, and so I, I made a very conscious decision when the peace came and uh, we decided that one of the things that we could do was to ensure that if in fact it all fell apart, it wouldn't be as easy to get back to war. That was one of the things that, that we had done. Uh, and we started to, to have conversations and in fact, we, we still laugh about it. We discovered Butrus Butrus Yale. And he made more sense to us than the peace, than the Good Friday Agreement. But we could see from that where the Good Friday Agreement sat, so we could leave it over there. And then the European peace monies came, and we discovered that people uh, like us who were doing other work, I mean, I, at that time, after we'd been shot, we were emergency housed in River Park. River Park was Coal Island's equivalent of early Ballymun. And mind you, Quill Island was a place to behold itself. <laughs> so Quill Island's Ballymun was a wonderful wonder to behold. And it was a great place, the most resilient people. But a number of women and myself had set up in a derelict house, what we called the, called the community house. And we had just set up, because of the problems on the estate, we, uh, and things that I'd learned, in fact, from being other places, I'd learned it from the Panthers. We had a breakfast club in a derelict house in Coal Island. And uh, nobody knew we were there. And we had a couple of social workers off the radar who used to bring us things that the government no longer needed, like chairs and tables, but then told us, you know, if anybody, if you ever say we brought them, we will disown you, because in terms of red tape, social workers shouldn't really have been helping us to set up children's clubs in derelict houses. But of course, when the peace came along, down came the European funds and they were offering us 100,000 pounds and 200,000 pounds. And, and these were working people who, who had no money at all. And, uh, and they didn't want it. Not because they didn't want peace, they didn't want it because it frightened them. They had a very good instinct that said, you're coming around here telling me that we can get £100,000 for this piece of work that we're doing. You'll be around tomorrow to put us in jail for not using it properly. <laughs> and so what we did, we decided we'd get together and start to figure out how this worked. And we put together, uh, when, when, they, when they, we fought at, local, at the local level with our council for a village by village needs assessment. And we spent about, we must have spent about two months going around every village and every community, asking people, and we've worked that way ever since, asking people what they need as different to what they want. 
what they need and what they want and what they already have. And we had a very simple rule, is money is the last thing we need. Not that we don't need money, but our rule is money is the last thing we need. We need to sit down together. We need to see what everybody needs, what everybody wants, what everybody has, and then see why we can't share this in this space. And we all agree that our communities should be communities of place. You would set out your village. So might be a majority Protestant village, might be a majority Catholic village, might be a middle class village, which meant it was 50-50, but there weren't a lot of poor people in it. Uh, but whatever it was, you had to see what you needed and you had to set out your space and see how you made room for everybody else and how you made it work. And we just had conversations about our own prejudices and our own fears and our own needs and then you would build up a program for, for that place and everybody in it, everybody needed different things. It wasn't rocket science, but it worked. Uh, so whenever we had new inward migration, which we did, the opportunity arising from the peace was that in the agri-food and engineering industry in which Dungannon and that part of Mid-Ulster depends, once you had peace, the, there was more economic um, opportunity, but we didn't have the skills. So new immigrants were brought in who were skilled meat workers, uh, and skilled engineers. And we began to see straight away prejudices and language that had begun to be eradicated coming back again in terms of racism. And we just tried the model again. We just went back to the communities and said, right, you know, this community is now bigger. There is now this group of people, and we sit down again. And that's where some of the conversations came out of saying, hang on a minute, this was for us, and said, no, but we now include this group of people, and we start at the bottom again. So it's not, it's not rocket science. It's labor intensive, but it works. If you want to know what the people need, don't ask God, he doesn't know. And don't ask Sinn Féin, they don't know. <laughs> And don't ask me, because I don't know. But if you want to know what people need, go and ask them what they need. And they'll tell you. And if what they need is, if they, what they need is the foreigners to leave, then you have a conversation that has to be held, uh, and a debate and a conversation that has to be held. And the outcome of that has to be an understanding that that's not going to happen and you don't have an entitlement to have that happen. And so we have basically rights-based conversations that say everybody has equal rights. There are duty bearers who are there to protect all our rights. We need to hold them to account. But you as a citizen and a human being have a citizen and human being and moral responsibility to protect this person's rights as well as yours. And that's how it works. Come and join us if you feel like doing some of that. Well, thanks very much. And uh, I really think it's tremendous work that you're doing and needs to be replicated all over the place. Mm -hmm. And you know what you said earlier about immigration and about the, the you know, it is, and I don't like to be saying this because I don't live in the north anymore, but that, you know, when I watch current affairs discussions on the television here and so on, some of it is just so petty and so local. When you have people dying by the thousands in the Mediterranean, when you have a whole city being wiped out in front of our eyes on the television every night mm -hmm. in, in Syria, and so on, and it's important to, to bear this in mind, and to, to realize that we have a duty to provide homes for people from, who are fleeing from, from conflicts which are actually largely provoked in the first place by the first world. Uh, so there is a responsibility and a duty there. One of the interesting things 
about uh, politics in the South at the minute is that it, it is now so fragmented that there is room, you know, there is room for political debate and discussion uh, in Doyle and uh, 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 that there hasn't been before. And I think that the opposition, the anti-austerity alliance, people before profit, have been using that space and, and providing that kind of leadership uh, so that the Doyle has become uh, an opportunity for making those voices heard and for people hearing uh, the alternatives and the alternative ways of struggling. Uh, and I think it's a thing that people also forget uh, for all its weaknesses about the southern state, about, about the Dáil, that it is actually a government. You know, it is, it is governing. Uh, and, and can therefore more easily be, be held directly to account because it is responsible and, and the level, you know, the, the, the level of, of government is closer to the people. Now we do in, in the North have the Assembly, but we delude ourselves, or some people delude themselves, that that is government. That is a, a regional Assembly of government which is sitting in Westminster. And you can see that around, you know, around the issue of Brexit, for example, that uh, what's perfectly clear is that none of these small governments or let on governments will be allowed to have any say in a high policy decision like that. That will be taken by the real government, which, uh, which is still sitting in Westminster. So the opportunity that you might actually change the mind of government or, or fight in, in, for change in the South uh, has a bit more traction than, than trying, trying to do it here. If you look and say, do you despair? From my point of view, no, but then I was reared to consider it a free state that wasn't really free, it was only rented on a 99-year lease. <laughs> and, and the lease is up. I just wanted to ask, and you've been inspired by America in the past, our civil rights movement, and you talked a little bit about being inspired by the Breakfast for Children program. Um, what can you offer us as inspiration for what's going on in America now um, for Black Lives Matter and the effectiveness that you've had here with the police, is there any words of wisdom and insight that you can offer us? No, I, 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 don't, I don't personally have wisdoms and insights. I think what is important and, and important to know is, is particularly uh, in this city, the support that there has been certainly from, from uh, people before profit from the Bloody Sunday March Committee over many years, and I see now the lights have gone up. I see my, my good friends and mentors, Kate and everybody down here. Uh, the, the Bloody Sunday March commemoration uh, committee has over, increasingly over a number of years, tried to make the connections around the battle for justice uh, for, for the families here. And, and, and that, that is happening in other places. So we've had speakers from Black Lives Matter over here on the demonstrations. And it's making that kind of connection that, uh, that people aren't alone. We are not alone in the way we are being punished. We're not alone in the way that ordinary people are, are singled out and victimized. We're not alone in the way that governments uh, and armies and police can, can act without any accountability. So why should we be alone in the struggle against that? You know, why should we be separated? And, and it's crucially important, not only for us to make the connections with organizations like Black Lives Matter, but for them to make the connections with us. Now, we are not black, but the same thing is happening. And it's for people that, that's where I, you know, when I had the opportunity to go to America, that's where I was able to understand that although within the context of Northern Ireland, 
what was happening to me was happening to me because I was poor, Catholic, working class and female. It took me a while to figure all of those out. But it didn't just only happen. It happened to me here because that was the context. But I could see the same things happened to people in America. And the people in America it happened to were not white Catholic Americans. In fact, quite a lot of them were cheering on the injustice. What was happening, the same thing was happening to people in the context of America, was that the people were not white, mostly. That's what determined whether you were poor, uh, whether you got arrested, and whether you got put in prison. So I think it's important to make the connections both ways. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I am not the possessor of wisdom or insight. I think the wisdom and the insight is within the people who are suffering the injustice and, and growing, growing those insights and understanding the true nature of why it happens is about making the connections with other people who suffer the same consequences but don't look exactly like you and you'll find then you know it's happening to people in Saudi Arabia it's happening to people in 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 America it's happening to people here it's happening to everybody everybody who can be scapegoated to create division and and the real terrorists are the people who are paid to maintain law and order. The people who can kill with impunity are the upholders of law and order. The world over. I'm still always trying to figure out why we need armies and why we need police forces and why we need prisons. And, and I think if we could answer those questions, we could do away with do away with the police. And what about a conversation on why do we need police? And certainly why do we need and why do we need them armed? And to terrorize us into doing what we're told. And and if, if they keep shooting people, then other people will behave themselves, lest it be them. So I don't have wisdoms. I, I tell you what I do have. Absolute inspiration from people in people in America for, who against all those odds will still stand up will still stand in the street will still come out in solidarity and say we're not putting up with this you know we could be inspired by you to get off our asses again and stop taking it yeah. I think the, it's appropriate to, to stress again, you know, the degree to which the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland, the, the debt it owed to the civil rights movement in the United States. We were a generation who grew up seeing on television what was going on in Little Rock and places like that and the treatment of black people in the United States. It inspired the movement here, but we have to remember that inspiration constantly and, you know, express our support and solidarity now with black people who are now suffering the same sort of oppression mm -hmm. they were suffering in the 1960s. Yep. Sorry, next question. Bernadette, um, you probably don't know this, but we've been on a journey together. Um, in 1972, you and I kept a lonely vigil outside uh, the polling station in Harold's Cross, Dublin. We were advising people to vote against joining the common market because it was a rich man's club. Uh, like you, I recently voted uh, to remain. Uh, you, were, you, were, you were a bit more successful than me in voting for Jeremy because I was disenfranchised twice uh, over it. My, my, my ballot didn't come in. Uh, but what I wanted to ask you was, I know why I uh, made that journey from advising people in 1972 not to join uh, and, and voting remain. I'd like to hear just 
where, where you have come to that decision and, and how you envisage it uh, working down locally here, you know, where most people did vote to remain and, and, and obviously also in Scotland. Uh, can we convince Theresa May that Brexit does not mean Brexit because people voted to leave mostly for the wrong reasons? Well, uh, I think, uh, sort of very briefly, my preferred option, which I think we should all have done was going back to elections. I, I'm not a big believer in government. I have fought a number of elections and had the misfortune to win one twice. <laughs> elections are great opportunities because people are focused, their minds are focused to campaign. And, and sometimes it's good if you get somebody elected and sometimes it's better if you don't. Uh, so again, with the, the remain, with, with the Brexit, I think that we should have actually, I'm going to say we, I mean the, the left, should have agreed on a position that there was essentially a plague on both your houses because in, in, the, in, in the immediate and, and longer term future, for working people in or out of the European Union, our future is being determined uh, by elites that haven't been elected. But the reason that I, I, part of the reason that I went for Remain was that, that people on the left whom I love dearly went for Brexit and, and had to say, look, I, I need not to be, I know I did my best in Derry, but I needed not to be then associated with Brexit because for me and the work that I was currently doing it was clear and totally accept that the people who voted to leave the European Union were not universally racists, but almost every racist voted to leave the European Union. And so for me, there was an immediate issue that while leaving the European Union did not make life easier for the great bulk of the working class or for anybody, uh, that the, the movement for Brexit was being led not by a progressive move, you know, not by a progressive, there was no real traction for progressive arguments on the weaknesses of uh, an increasingly undemocratic and militarized elite Europe, but was being led by a campaign to leave Europe because it wasn't bad enough to leave Europe because it, it allowed immigrants to come in, to leave Europe because it imposed a number of basic workers' rights, uh, it cr because it allowed for, however limited within the European Union, if not third world countries, freedom of movement. Uh, for workers and families and, and others, and that all of that was being eroded, and that the act of a successful Brexit strengthened the hand of the right. It left the right wing with its tail up. And I think that I'm right in that. I think that if you look at, if you look at the, the British exit position, uh, and so it was tactical. Do I think Europe, the European Union is a great place to be? No. Do I think it's riddled with problems? Yes. Uh, but do I think that the unilateral act of leaving it, as I said before, legging it with the Brits, to recreate the British economic empire was a progressive movement? Uh, I, th I think not. So having voted Remain, you know, if we had uh, if we had a different axis, if we had Greece and Portugal and Spain leading a left wing exit, then we could all campaign that Dublin should join because we'd be going to do something, you know, going to do something that worked or that might work better. As it is, uh, we're not. And yet, part of me has to, you know, because basically I'm a maverick and an anarchist, I think, 
I don't know what I am. But there's a part of me recognizes that however ill-informed the decision, however screwed up the politics of the decision, the act was, however limited, an act of participatory democracy against elitism. And maybe the next time we get to be more, you know, get that kind of participative opportunity, we'll be better informed about the choices that we make. So sometimes, sometimes you know, you make, you make the wrong decision, but the right to make the decision should always, should always reside with us. And I think that that's part of the tension that we're seeing around here as well. There is a battle going on, and we need to talk about that more. There's a battle going on with what we call representative democracy and participative democracy. And there's a battle going on that is now quite differently uh, argued sometimes between public power and private power. And, and some of the participative citizen collective actions that are going on in the middle that are being overlooked because we take these hard ideological positions. You have to be ideologically for this you know, this is the Marxist line, this is the neoliberal line. And, and we can be very narrow about looking at new forms of democratic action that are being developed. And part of that is because we're a bundle of monoglots and we can't understand anything that's de being developed anywhere if it's not being developed in English. And, and there's a whole richness of the world that we're missing out on because we, we haven't got a clue. We haven't got a clue, really, what's happening in South America, what's happening in Africa, or, or what's happening in Asia. If it's not happening in English, we don't know about it. It's not happening on Facebook, the world doesn't know about it. <laughs> but believe me, whether you know about it or not, it's happening. I don't know if that answered your question on, on Remain or not. So basically, I voted Remain. That doesn't say I intend to remain too long. Anybody else? Yes, there's somebody up at the top at the back there. I read your maiden speech on my way up this today, and you talked about the haves and the have-nots, and we still have the haves and the have-nots, and you were speaking about uh, the participatory democracy, and it looks like in the US there could be an active participatory democracy that would elect Donald Trump. And I think the anger that might elect Donald Trump is being channeled in a particular way, and perhaps it's the same anger that Black Lives Matter feel, because I think it's created by the same things. But how are we going to combat that level of corporate power that exists in the world now? How can you change that? We're only going to change it by actively engaging at the bottom. You know, we, who are we? Who are the we that's going to change it? It is not going to change until people change it themselves. And, and you know, it comes down to... It, it can come down to you and say, look, how are we going to build a revolutionary vehicle? How are we going to build a revolutionary party? Certainly not by bickering amongst ourselves over who was the one true revolutionary party founded by Marx, who is not God. And if God doesn't exist, we shouldn't then invent new gods. That's me out of the revolution for good now. <laughs> but no, but you know what I mean. When you say, just when you were saying there, you know, about, about Donald Trump, which is right. But the, but the power of corporate America isn't the fear of Donald Trump. Donald Trump is to my mind, the fear of fascism and ignorance and, and the manipulation of, of people. But will, will America be any safer under Hillary Clinton? I mean, if, if it was me, uh, I still, I'm still slightly devastated that good old Bernie Saunders 
threw his hat in the democratic ring at the finish because fundamentally he was a democrat. I think people in America want to do something constructive around the elections, they should actually vote for Jill Stein and the Green Party. That's what I think they should do. But there's a part, I have a friend in America and, and she's waiting for me to tell her when to panic. <laughs> I absolutely love, Amer love Americans. Nowhere else in the world would you have somebody who would say, Bernadette, I am happy putting my faith in you and I won't panic till you tell me to panic. <laughs> and just because she's my friend, I said, that's good, because I know that she won't panic till I tell her to panic. <laughs> and so I am going to keep her from panicking by never telling her to panic. <laughs> but the issue is she, she can't sleep at night with the idea of Donald Trump. And then I have to tell you what I did tell her. I said, look, Here's one of two things that will happen. Donald Trump won't get elected, so then you can stop panicking if that's all's worrying you. Or two, he will get elected. And then if he does get elected, he will either do just the same as Hillary Clinton will do, and he'll, he'll having raised the, the fears to get elected, he'll just go on being a standard American president like all the rest. Or he won't. And if he doesn't, and it's not in America's corporate, inter corporate interest for him to go around building walls in Mexico and insulting the rest of the world, he'll fall down a flight of stairs. That's what the CIA are for. <laughs> so I would worry about Hillary Clinton if I were you. Okay, we, we, I think we have to wind up, but we have one other person who was looking to get in for a while, Lady who's here. I'm fearful my country's headed for fascism, if it's not already there. I do have a vote, and it's really a dilemma, because I was a Bernie Sanders supporter. And all I can hope is that we can start again at the grassroots and, and, mm -hmm. and do something, build on what he started. Uh, so... Go for it, Margie. <laughs> I want to thank all those who helped this opportunity to happen. Most of all, I want to thank Billy Hall, who found a way of providing the money that was necessary to, and it has been necessary, to fund even something as simple and apparently uh, basic as a public lecture. Billy found a way of persuading corporate America, Irish America, to give its money without, without conditions, or so far, without conditions. And the last thing I want to say is that, you know, we, we, we do live in a world that is so chaotic and so unjust that we keep saying to ourselves, how can it go on? You know, capitalism is breaking up. Its own momentum has led to a collision which has, is fatal to it. But we have been saying that for exactly 150 years. We've been saying that and seen those who protested against it decimated in wars and in civil strife and by the powers that be. There is nothing new in injustice, but there is something new in the idea of a Republican democracy. That's about the only form of political organization that has advanced in the last century. And the form of Republican organization is dependent upon ourselves and upon us knowing and actually acting, as Bernadette has taught us so often, acting as citizens, which means people who put the interest of the public before their own. To have that kind of public conscience and consciousness. To say that those sectarian and other motives that are so often made available in general elections through the media, which of course is another source of pollution, 
But to try and find that idea of a Republican personality, it's very difficult because for a public to have virtue is for a public to go against its own interests in many ways and in many areas. But you know, we often say it's an old Republican Roman idea, but in some ways it is. To say that in order that we survive in our interest, the interest of the people at large, it is necessary to make that, that step to recognize the relationship between virtue and being a citizen and, pe and vice and refusing to be a citizen, supporting only sectarian and self-interested uh, oh, parties, parades of, parades of prejudice, and all of those things that are, in a way, controlled by the money, the money system. And I'll just remind ourselves, Bernadette was talking about the 13, wasn't the 13 billion that was offered uh, to Ireland? Billion. Billion, billion. billion. Whatever sum was offered. There's this, to note the contradictions that the system actually produces on itself. As Ireland is now given this, it's not money, of course, or in some way it is money, it's a figure on a piece of paper. But because the capitalist system is in its present condition, because you get no interest now on that kind of investment, Ireland actually has to pay money to hold that money. And it'll pay money at negative interest rates until the, until the Apple case begins. Then it'll be suspended. Then, of course, it'll be dispersed. And anyone who gets the Apple money realizes that if it is given, they say, a part to Austria, a part to France, those countries will have to wait for the next case that Apple will bring to suspend payment. And the payment will be suspended for so long that after a while we will find that half a dozen countries have held the money, paid for it, and then it has disappeared. And uh, it's not only Apple, but it's also the system itself has created an idea of money that is not compatible anymore with an idea of living. And this is what Bernadette has taught us so often throughout the, the last 20 years or so. And our thanks from Field Day to her for coming here this evening.